Good evening and welcome. We are so pleased that you are able to join us for our 16th annual An Evening to Promote Racial Justice. I am Raven Exon Washington, a proud member of the YWCA's Southeast Wisconsin Board of Directors. And on the behalf of Kimberly Noon, our board chair, as well as all of our other board of directors, we welcome and thank you for your time and commitment. The year 2020 has taught us a lot about ourselves, our communities, and our societies. Specifically, it highlights why nights and events like this are so very important. Where more so than making peace, it is time and needed for us to make justice. And I personally am so proud to be a part of an organization that can call out racism clearly and boldly and provide solutions as to what you can do to get involved and to stay engaged. Tonight's program will begin with a centering moment one that highlights those that called this land home before the United States of America. Following this centering moment, our dual MCs, Martha Berry, Chief Racial Justice Officer, and Paula Pennebaker, retired president and CEO, and executive counsel to YWCA Southeast Wisconsin, will introduce us to our awardees. YWCA USA CEO, Alejandro Castillo, will then follow in a fireside chat with Paula. In keeping with tradition, that conversation will be followed by Q&A with you, the audience. Again, we thank you for your time. We believe that this evening will be everything that you need it to be. And while having a night to promote racial justice, I encourage you all to have a life that promotes racial justice. I now want to introduce you to our president and CEO, Ms. Jenny Finn. Thank you, Raven, and thank you to our board of directors. Your partnership makes our mission possible, a mission to eliminate racism and empower women. And that's a bold mission, but we also have a vision for Southeast Wisconsin. We envision a thriving, just, and inclusive community based on the cornerstones of racial and gender justice. That's how we get to healthy communities. We are grateful that you're also joining us tonight from the comfort of your home. Many of you join us every year, and some of you are new. We look forward to next year being in person together. Although we are gathering virtually, sponsors are an essential part of putting the evening together, as well as supporting all of our racial justice programming. They are listed in your online program. But we would like to express a special appreciation to our overall supporters of racial justice of long standing. They include the Brewers Community Foundation, the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, Molson Coors, Rockwell Automation, and Quarles and Brady. And tonight we have key sponsors for the event, Rockwell Automation, Quarles and Brady, and special support from Festival Foods. Additional sponsors and supporters for the event are in your program. So it's 2020. Here we are. We are standing in a moment of profound pain. COVID, economic upheaval, and systemic violence against black and brown people. And not just George Floyd, but a litany of people. We were all well aware of racial inequities prior to COVID and prior to this year. But the crisis has laid bare the depth and degree of the reality that we live in. COVID has hit communities of colors hard and continues to burden them. More recently, suburban and rural communities, white communities, are now feeling the pain of COVID. Clearly, we all need to collectively take responsibility for ending this pandemic. COVID has also laid bare more than health inequities. Economic fallout continues to cascade, and it is falling especially hard on women, and particularly women of color. And so as a result, YWCA Southeast Wisconsin's mission could not be more obviously timely. Our work is here to support women and their families, especially women of color. But in this moment of profound pain caused by the systemic violence against people of color, there are also other forms of racism that we must confront. Will this moment of profound pain 
finally carry us forward to profound change? Will it carry us forward to actively work for racial justice? This is a question that I, on my justice journey, must ask consistently, especially of my fellow white people. Are we ready to be part of committing to real change? At YWCA Southeast Wisconsin, we understand that all of this work must be done together and in collaboration. And that includes you, our audience. That's why tonight, we want to make it easy for you to support our work. You can register on our, to get email, and you can also at many times during the evening, click on the link to make a donation because your time and your financial resources are part of this collaboration. If tonight is not convenient, you can visit our website 24 seven and click that donate button, www.ywcasew.org. Before we continue, we will have a quiet moment to center and reflect and respect those who called this land home before European colonization. And after that reflection, we will continue to hear about justice journeys and build the future. Thank you. Hi, welcome to this evening's uh, evening to promote racial justice. We're so pleased to have you here. Before we get started into our program, we want to start with a centering moment and acknowledge the land that we're on. This land in southeastern Wisconsin is the part of the Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee nations. Our state early on was home to 13 different tribes, so we are meeting on sacred ground. And we know that genocide and forced removal changed the landscape for our indigenous brothers and sisters. I invite you to recognize that the native people who are with us are thriving. And we center our time tonight acknowledging that the work on ending racism requires us to reflect on the fact that we're on stolen land and that we also need to know that the native people who lived here before and are alive and thriving today have stories to tell. We get to listen to them, welcome their pain and their triumphs. And I invite you to dedicate yourself to learning, to growing, and to contributing to the thriving of the Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee nations. So let's just take a moment to center ourselves. All right, so as we transition, I wanna welcome my co-MC, Paula Pannebaker. So nice to have you return to support our evening. You and I were central. Uh, I've been at the YWCA for 13 years in forming um, this, well, the evening was going, but you were really helpful in helping us to decide to stand together and continue this event. And this year has been a, a whirlwind year that has shown us pain and despair and grief and small triumphs. First of all, hi, Martha. It's great to be here with you. I was so pleased that you asked me to join you tonight to support YWCA Southeast Wisconsin, especially given the racial unrest we've faced this year. It makes the work of promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all particularly important. Yeah, 2020. <clears throat> Who knew we'd be facing such a COVID health crisis and witnessing the deep-seated unrest that racial and racial injustice has brought to the forefront through the murder of uh, many other murders of black and brown family members and watching what happened in Kenosha with Jacob Blake. At the same time, watching the most vulnerable in our communities face new odds in caring for their families. This year has just delivered challenge upon challenge upon challenge to the people that we serve. And our small but mighty staff has been on a journey themselves one that has required them to pivot to everything being online and delivering new horizons for people who are completing their GEDs and HSEDs, learning financial literacy, and in some cases, learning to address foundational racial justice um, issues in taking their first step or their next step to make changes. Given that we pivoted to online over the course of this year, we had to cap both our summer and our fall Unlearning Racism Tools for Action series because we really wanted to maintain the experience for people. 
and we knew that um, hosting 150 people this fall in three different classes meant that we were covering a lot of ground in terms of racial justice content, but we also wanted to ensure that people felt connected to one another. And we saw that in some of the projects that people did at the end of the class. Uh, one group talked about uh, really being able to look at physical space and is that physical space welcoming for all people. But we also had the opportunity to work with uh, Renaissance Theater Works, who's putting together their Belonging Play series. And I hope some of you were able to join Renaissance this weekend in connecting with them on their plays. They promise to be really good conversation starters for folks that are looking at important topics on race and racism today. And we know that within that, we can find triumph and joy in uh, thinking about the arts as a way of looking at some of these issues. Again, Martha, it really has been a tough year. I'm pleased to see that YWCA Southeast Wisconsin has continued to serve our community and address longstanding needs. As I reflected on this event, I thought about the great work of the awardees and their immeasurable value to the Milwaukee area. And of course, the amazing speakers who have illustrated the continuing need for the YWCA's work. I loved hearing from speakers such as Michael Eric Dyson, Rebecca Sklude, Rebecca um, Soledad O'Brien, but one of my favorite speakers, you know, was Harry Belafonte. Some of our patrons were disappointed that they didn't get to hear him sing, but everyone was blown away by his quiet nature in recounting of his work during the civil rights movement. He encouraged us to keep fighting the good fight, not unlike John Lewis reminding us to get into good trouble. This has been a year to embark on a justice journey. Individually, we must ask ourselves where we are on our journey. And to our audience, are you actively working? How can you get better, stronger? If you're standing on the sideline, you need to get in the game and make some noise. Mix it up a bit. Each of us needs to assess where we stand on justice issues and identify where we want to be. I agree, Paula. It is a journey and we invite you to consider joining us because what we've witnessed this year has been a massive chasm in race relations. And so we have witnessed a crater that has brought forward the deep and uh, unsettling look at both the racism, the civil um, rights and the voting rights, but it's also brought to our attention how many families have been deeply impacted by COVID and police brutality. So this journey towards justice is not simple. It's not easy. It can be twisting and bumpy. It can be troubling. And through it all, we're very aware that the YWCA has decided to stay the course. The journey toward justice is our theme tonight. We want to celebrate two key leaders in our communities who have shown an enduring commitment to make a difference. Our two award winter winners for empowering women and eliminating racism are outstanding women. Yes, our Empowering Women Award winner for 2020 is being given this year to Vicki Selko, who's a treasured colleague of ours at the YWCA, who works in the city of Racine. Vicki is the manager of strategic initiatives and community partnerships for the city. In that role, she helps lead the city's efforts to tackle systemic disparities and inequities and works closely with community residents along with partner organizations to support and scale up effective strategies and programs. Vicki has been engaged in policy, advocacy, and systems change in Wisconsin for more than 20 years. She's a public interest attorney who has represented low-income clients in employment, housing, and public benefits cases, has led statewide anti-poverty policy advocacy efforts, and was chief of staff to a state representative for nearly six years. Vicki has also spent four years as a lobbyist for Wisconsin's largest civil legal aid law firm and was the lead instructor for the Wisconsin Women's Networks Policy Institute, which empowers women from around the state to become effective policy advocates. Vicki's a graduate of Beloit College and the University of Wisconsin Law School and lives in the city of Racine with her husband and his two cats. We'll hear from Vicki in just a moment. Thanks, Martha. We're also pleased to recognize Charlene Moore for our Eliminating Racism Award. 
Charlene has committed her life to building and sustaining grassroots leadership for change. She has a passion for community justice, which led her to co-found Urban Underground in 2000, a nationally recognized grassroots youth development organization whose members have been at the forefront of youth-led social change in Milwaukee and the region. She is also the founding member of Youth Justice Milwaukee, a broad-based campaign directed at the needs of incarcerated youth, the majority of which are black and brown boys. The organization's work is to advocate for the creation of community-based, family-centered restorative programs as an alternative to imprisonment in Wisconsin facilities. This is a practice that destroys hope, breaks spirits, and rarely leads to positive outcomes. Charlene's efforts have touched the lives of countless young people and inspired a new generation of youth leaders that will lead the struggle for justice and equity. She currently serves as the director of both Youth Justice Milwaukee and Urban Underground located in Milwaukee. Thank you, Paula. So those are our two award winners. We want to welcome them to uh, join us now. Hi, Vicki. Hi, Charlene. It's so good to have both of you with us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. So we're pleased to give the awards to you, but we're really pleased to thank you for all of your continued efforts. We know that you not only make a difference in the communities and working with the uh, folks that you work with, but you continue to epitomize for many people in our communities, just strength and courage and character and everything that you do in making such a difference in people's lives every day. So we're welcoming you tonight to have a chance for you to share a little bit about your justice journey. So we're gonna have a conversation because we want our audience to realize that they can get engaged in a justice journey themselves. And you know, I think a lot of times people see award winners as these extraordinary people that have superhero skills. I know both of you have capes, but the reality is I know you to both be amazing women and you don't see yourselves as particularly special. So we want you to be able to tell your story so that other people can see how they can join this, this justice journey. So we're going to start with Vicki and have you just share a little bit about what prompted you to get involved and uh, how did your journey look? Thank you so much. I'm so um, honored to be with everybody having this conversation. I'm so appreciative of the partnership of the YWCA and all of your staff who I'm just um, delighted to get to work with every day in the city of Racine and really um, humbled to receive this award. Uh, what a great question about my justice journey. I, I don't get to think about that very often. You just sort of get caught up in doing the work every day and you don't really think about how you got here. Um, for me, I mean, I've been doing this work in Wisconsin now for more than 20 years. And when I think back to how I, how I got on this path, I think it really started um, after college. I graduated from Bullock College, as you said, and I had a, a fellowship opportunity in DC right after graduation. So I moved out to DC and I really disliked working for a federal government agency. I just knew right away that was not what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted more ability to make change. I wanted more autonomy. And so I left that fellowship and I became a grassroots community organizer in Washington, D.C. And I went door to door in one of the most economically challenged neighborhoods in the country, the southeast neighborhood of D.C. Um, called the Anacostia. And so everyone should sort of picture this, that I was this relatively naive, privileged, relatively sheltered white girl from the Midwest going door to door in southeast D.C., talking to primarily African-American women about their neighborhood and about why was it that the city didn't run buses into their neighborhood? Why was it that trash didn't get picked up in their neighborhood? Why was it that the city allowed drug needles to litter their neighborhood parks and make them places where their kids and grandkids couldn't play safely? Why were drug dealers allowed to hang out on corners? Um, all of these injustices every day that they saw that they knew would never be tolerated in whiter, richer neighborhoods of that same city. And that experience first in DC as an organizer and then with the same organization in Milwaukee was really transformative for me. Um, I was invited into people's homes 
to sit in their living rooms, to drink iced tea with them, to hear about their pride and their families and their neighborhoods, to listen to their stories they told about how their neighborhoods used to be filled with well-maintained homes that were owned by people, vibrant parks and thriving schools and thriving Black-owned businesses. They all told all stories about how if you screwed up on one end of the block when you were a kid, your grandmother or your mother would hear about it by the time you got home at the other end of the block. Um, it was really powerful for me to learn that to what so many was just viewed as a poor neighborhood was to its residents a place that they really used to be proud of and wanted to be proud of again, and to witness firsthand how deeply painful it was and frustrating it was for them to see that their neighborhoods had been neglected, ignored, starved of resources, and that powerful people in other parts of their same city seemed to have written them off and written off their children and their grandchildren. And so I worked with those neighborhood residents to be able to see their own power, to experience what can happen when they come together with a plan and with a purpose. Um, they learned that they could, in fact, bring resources and accountability and change to their neighborhood. And it was profoundly powerful for me as a young person to learn how to help others, learn how to help them lead, um, to help them plan meetings with their city council members, with landlords, with police, with people in positions of power, and to learn that it wasn't for me to do the work. My job was to help open the door for them to see that they could do it and help to give them the confidence and the skills to do it well. And so I worked at that organization for more than a year in, Milwaukee, in DC and also in Milwaukee, and it really changed my understanding and, and shaped to this day, my understanding of community activism, of power and how power works and what um, those in power listen to, what gets them to change, how to influence those in power and how to really bring about lasting systems level change. And for me also, I really learned what it feels like to step outside your own comfort zone, to go into somebody else's neighborhood and to make yourself secondary to their needs, their plans, and to help them lead on the issues that they cared about. I mean, those were lessons I take with me to this day in my work in the city of Racine. And I have never forgotten those experiences and also really how hungry people are to be invited into the room where it happens. We all know the Hamilton lyric, right? People wanna be in the room where it happens. And people wanna be in that room and they wanna have the skills to make a difference once they've seized that invitation and walked through that door. And so for me, I think that experience probably more than anything shaped my, the work that I do now and my justice journey. Thank you so much for um, sharing that. You can feel the passion in what um, has gone on. So Charlene, I want you to be able to share a little bit about your justice journey. So let's hear from you. Absolutely. Um, for, first of all, thank you all so much for, for this amazing um, opportunity. And Vicki, oh my gosh, um, sharing that beautiful um, story. Definitely, I, I feel uh, a lot of who it is that you are just from listening to that. Um, I'm so honored and grateful for the work of the YWCA. And, you know, I accept this not just for me. Um, I accept this on behalf of the hundreds of young people um, and community partners and community members um, that make up this great city uh, of Milwaukee. And, you know, for me, my journey started, a big part of it started, you know, way back before I actually came to this country. I was an immigrant uh, of, this, uh, of, of, of this country. And um, I remember I'm from Jamaica and I'm born and raised there until I was about six years old. And I remember my grandmother always making sure that everyone else had something, you know, so a lot of the crops we grew on our land and she was always making sure that someone, you know, our neighbors um, always had something. And so mm -hmm. when anyone would come to the house, she would always make sure that, you know, we got them something. And for me, that started my perception of how we treat community and how we treat each other. And as I um, grew up here in the city of Milwaukee, um, I remember about, you know, Vicki, you mentioned, you know, that, that um, modality of just na being neighborly and, and, and what community really meant. And I know that a lot of times we've gone away from that, but 
it really um, did a lot for me when I was growing up, particularly when I got to high school where a lot of my journey, you know, began. Uh, I started out um, as a swim instructor at the YMCA. I, you know, they came to my school and it was all about, you know, do you want to, do you want a job? And we're like, yes, we want to work. We want, you know, young people, they want to do for themselves, right? And that's how I got my start at the YMCA. And from there, it allowed me to meet some incredible young people and to also um, start a UB. I was one of the founding members of a club called Leaders Club, uh, which is now part of the Black Achievers program. And I had amazing adult mentors that, um, Viola Rembert was one of those amazing uh, adult members that allowed young people to know that, um, and Vicki, you mentioned that word power. They allowed us to know that we innately had that power to be a part of our own change and to be a part of our own circumstances and changing the conditions, you know, that we lived in. And from that moment, knowing that we were able to build a youth club, you know, from about 10 young people to over 80 young people that met every other week and we were able to, you know, do things in our community and um, be able to manage our own money and um, go on trips and do community work. That propelled me into the work of starting um, Urban Underground. And I co-founded Urban Underground with my now husband, Reggie Moore, who, uh, were, who is the director of the Office of Violence Prevention. And that premise of um, putting back that power into young people, that the power that they already have, that uh, they already exist, them realizing that they have the potential and the energy and, um, and, and, and the ability to be able to change the conditions in this city. That has really allowed me to, to know that we have the power in this city to be able to change the, the conditions and, and those individuals that have marched over the summer, right? For, um, for our community to understand that there is better. We want better. Those are the things that we have to continue to fight for and to have those amazing, you know, individuals that have come out of Urban Underground who are now the county executive. So David Crawley, who is now the county executive was a member of Urban Underground or David Bowen, who was a state representative that understood all these young people have understood that they possess the innate ability to be able to change that they have to be a part of their change. So it's nothing special that any of us hold um, it's no special powers, you know, even though Martha, you mentioned that Kate that, you know, we may all have. It is that innate ability that all of us possess, especially when we tap into what is it that I can do as an individual? Mm -hmm. And that's what has propelled so much of the work that I do today. Well, both of you have just shared such lovely pieces of your story and it just, it, it, um, it just so encourages me in terms of what's possible. I know. It, it made me lose words. <laughs> <laughs> made me stumble. <laughs> so part of what we'd like you to wrap up with is, it, you know, we've got an audience that's paying attention to this evening, and we want to know if there's any other thoughts that you want to share with our audience members that would help them to figure out what they should do to engage, um, to address uh, racism or gender justice, anything that you, some final words that you want to pass on to people. Absolutely. So Vicki, go ahead. Oh, I was going to let Charlene go first on this one. I'm happy to go yeah. first. Differ. Yeah, no, I can jump in. Um, you know, I would add that, you know, a lot of times uh, we're all looking for what is that role? What is it that I can do? You know, I'm not eloquent at this or I can't do that. Um, mm -hmm. I tell people all the time because they always ask, well, Charlene, you know, how can I help? And, you know, I always go back to, you know, how do people, you know, look at your passion, look at what you're passionate about. Um, you have, you know, some people have time to volunteer somewhere. Um, some people have resources, right? You know, so give up your time, your talent, or your resources. We all have this um, ability to be able to um, make sure that we're a part of the change. I always use mm -hmm. uh, Mahatma Gandhi's um, quote, 
we must be the change we want to see in this world. And it's not about pointing the finger. Well, what are you going to do? What are, you know, we have to point back that finger at us and say, okay, what am I going to do? And, you know, a lot of times it's, it, it could be as simple as inviting someone over to the house that may be of a different race than you, right? It may be, you know, Vicky said, thinking um, outside the box and going outside of her comfort zone. It may be doing work in a neighborhood that may be different from your own. <coughs> We understand that the walking is very you know, segregated. So there's some things that we have to do, you know, have to do differently. But it's really stepping outside of our comfort zone, really reaching across, right, across neighborhoods, you know, um, it, it, and, and it may be, um, you know, uh, you know, it may be the person next door to you that you may not have spoken to, right? It could be those small little things that we use to help build community and help build a, a better um, Milwaukee and a better Wisconsin. Thanks so much, Sherilyn. Go ahead for it, Vicki. That, that, was, that was so beautifully said, Sherilyn. I really appreciate that. Um, I guess I would speak to the, to the white members of the audience in particular, particularly other white women. And, and I, I think I'd offer three things in particular. I mean, one is as white people, we have to commit to learning the history of white supremacy in this country. We have to learn how laws and policies enacted by white people have created profoundly inequitable conditions and limited access to resources and denied opportunities and produced starkly disparate outcomes in every area of life in this country. And no, we cannot expect our friends or coworkers of color to teach us that history. We have to learn it. So I would say that's that's number one. Um, number two is we have to acknowledge the tremendous privilege that allows us as white people to be to be bothered, to be upset, to be even outraged and saddened by events like the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey or Breonna Taylor or George Floyd or the rampant efforts to disenfranchise black and brown voters. But we have to acknowledge that we do not feel anywhere near the same level of emotional and physical response and trauma that our black and brown coworkers and neighbors and friends are feeling. And I see so much of white people these days who want to be allies, who are trying to express their outrage and their frustration about these events, but we cannot understand the pain and the trauma that systemic disenfranchisement, that violence by white people on black and brown bodies, that hundreds of years of inequity have caused and our response as white people to these events is not the same. And we can't pretend that we get it in the same way because we don't. So I, I think that's a second important thing I would offer to, to white folks who want to be on this journey and who want to be doing this work. We have to acknowledge that tremendous privilege and that difference in our reaction. And third, I think most important is we have to act. We have to actively and continuously work to open doors for people who do not look like us. We have to examine and evaluate whether our actions are contributing to the fight for justice or whether they're not. And I, I would ask people to ask questions like, are you just posting on social media about events that frustrate and outrage you? Or are you taking action? Are the organizations you volunteer with and support, are they led by people of color? Are you asking organizations in your community that are led by people of color what they need and then partnering with them, helping them address the needs that they've identified? Where are you giving your time? Where are you giving your money? Whose voices are you lifting up? Are you writing to elected officials and asking that they address these systemic inequalities in tangible ways? Um, are you opening doors for people of color through internships and opportunities and access to rooms where decisions get made. I think as white people, we so often think that we can just say that we are on this, this journey for justice and for equity. And I wanna be very clear, we have to do more than say that we're allies, we have to act that way. And it is a continuous process of learning and growth and finding new ways to act. I mean, for me, the action comes mainly in the forms of trying to seek out and working to implement policy solutions that are sustainable, that are scalable, that are 
hopefully proven to unravel these disparities and help us get to more equitable outcomes in communities like Racine. Um, and it also means really listening to and meaningfully partnering with people of color where we really are co-directing these efforts. And for those in the audience, it might look very different. Your action might look completely different than mine and that's okay, but you have to find your path of action and do your work to understand the history of white supremacy and understand your privilege and how that um, and what it means in your community. That's the work um, that I think white people in Racine and Milwaukee and Southeast Wisconsin, that's the journey and the work that we that we need to be on. That's amazing. Okay, well, <laughs> talk about it. Yes, you both have been so fabulous. I, I can tell the YWCA has selected the two both amazing women to receive our awards this year. And I'm so grateful um, that you were willing to take the time to share a little bit of your story and inspire other people to consider where they can jump into this journey. Uh, your dedication, your commitment, your passion just shows. And I, um, I'm just inspired again by what you've offered to the audience and it, by way of yourselves and how much that just makes such a difference for people. So thank you from the bottom of my heart and the YWCA's heart. We are deeply appreciative of the fact that you keep giving. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for all the work you do and for your leadership in our communities. And, and I would um, echo Vicky? those sentiments. Thank you all so very much. And let's get to work. Uh, Vicki just gave us some marching orders. So let's, <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. She did. And I want to tell Vicki that Southeast with, um, Washington could use you again. Now, we're, now they're dealing with gentrification. It's slowly moving into Southeast. And before you know it, all those people that you worked with before won't be there anymore. So thanks for what you did when you were there. And Charlene, what else are you going to start? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for another organization to pop up. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're shifting gears, Martha, to hear from the nationally recognized YWCA USA, President Alejandra Castillo. Alejandra has over two decades of professional experience in Washington, D.C., having served in senior leadership positions in two presidential administrations. Given her policy, legal, and business expertise, she has worked in various public, private, and nonprofit settings. We're in the midst of a group of overachievers tonight. <laughs> in 2014, Alejandra was appointed by the Obama administration to serve as the National Director of Minority Business Development Agency, becoming the first Hispanic American woman to lead that agency. In that role, she helped secure financing and capital in excess of $19 billion and created or retained over 33,000 jobs. With that background, she is distinctly qualified to reflect on how the impact of COVID, economic upheaval, and racial justice reckoning, and more, has impacted women, especially women of color. Alejandra holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics and Political Science from the State University of New York at Stony Brook a Master of Arts degree in Public Policy from the Lyndon Baines Johnson School of Public Affairs, University of Texas at Austin, and a Juris Doctorate from American University, Washington College of Law. Let's listen to Alejandra's perspective before welcoming her to join me for a chat. Good evening, my name is Alejandra Castillo and I serve as the CEO of YWCA USA. I am so delighted to have been invited to speak to you this evening, an evening to prom promote racial justice. Thank you, Ginny Finn, for your gracious invitation and to the YWCA of Southeast Wisconsin staff and volunteers. Your work is what makes YWCA. It is the work on the ground, the work that we do in communities all across the country. As many of you may know, YWCA is the oldest and largest women's organization in the country. Created in 1858, we're very proud of our legacy and our history, but we are so excited about our future. 
with over 200 YWCA associations across the country in 45 states serving 1,300 communities, YWCA is that trusted place where people know they can always find the help and support. But more importantly, we are agents of change. We create environments that help support and enhance the requisite resources and, and programs to help not just young girls and boys, not just women, but communities of color as a whole and communities in both rural, urban, and suburban areas. We have a proud, proud group of, of actions that we've taken throughout the year. From back in 1858, creating one of the first childcare centers in the country, marching for the eight hour workday, as well as creating the first women employment center for women who were coming from rural and from uh, other countries who were coming to the urban centers for work. Today, we are confronted with three very, very challenging situations. One, this pandemic, which is ravaging across the country. The she session, the economic recession that is anchoring around women because women have, so, have been so disproportionately impacted and the call for national reckoning on racial justice. These three tectonic plates are pushing against each other, challenging organizations like YWCA. We need to be bold and we need to be visionaries. What are we going to do, not just to get through this moment in time, but more importantly, to be able to pre create the, the right ecosystem for our communities to grow and thrive. It is there at that moment, at that intersection, that we are now focusing all of our attention, being able to support our associations across the country with the support of individuals like yourself. I know that we would have wanted to be in person, that these are the type of moments that we want to give each other a hug, a high five, just to recognize the incredible work that we do every day. But we are now forced to do this virtually. So I'm trying to convey with as much passion and as much zeal what it is that YWCAs are doing across the country. How is it that we are standing up at this moment in time? At YWCA USA, our main focus is working in the public policy and advocacy arena. Whether it's going to Congress, working with members of the House, working with the Senate, working with the administration, presenting amicus briefs when we have issues that are coming before the Supreme Court. Our work is to elevate, to really resonate across the halls of power, what it is that communities need. We are that voice. And throughout the, my time as CEO, our goal has also to been to galvanize and bring together all of our YWCAs across the country to be able to harness our voice not just our voice as it was heard back in the 19th century and the 20th, 20th century, but what is our voice in the 21st century? What is our responsibility? And I have to tell you, it is a glorious and joyous opportunity to see how YWCAs across the country are reimagining, are bringing forth their innovation to be able to solve the issues. As they say, those who are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. And that's exactly what YWCAs across the country do every single day. In recent months, we have been very fortunate to have uh, supporters uh, across the spectrum. And we launched our campaign, Until Justice Just Is, because we knew that in this moment in time, we could not let it go. We can't just let this be an, another episodic moment. We can't allow it to just be when the cameras are on, when the focus is on. YWCA has been working on racial justice for over 50 years. It's been part of our mission statement. And that is thanks to the great work of Dr. Dorothy Height, who back in 1970 said we needed to make sure that the YWCA's mission statement was eliminating racism and empowering women. And that was called the one imperative it's not an either or, it is one imperative because we know that we must tackle the issues of racial justice together with the issues of gender equity. And it's thanks to that vision that we today can authentically stand up and say that our work around racial justice is profound, 
It's intentional and it's relentless because again, we do the work when the cameras are on and when they're off. And that's the type of work that we want to continue to make sure that we can create that systemic change, to be able to dismantle discrimination and, and, and systemic racism across the country. Because when we do, our country will flourish. We will all flourish. So as you can see, I'm excited, even in this virtual setting, I'm excited because I get to journey with some of the most incredible people. Jenny Finn, the board of directors at Southeast Wisconsin YWCA, the staff, the staff that we need to give them a round of applause, as well as our volunteers. It takes an entire community to make change. And that's what excites me. Replicate this model across 1,300 different communities and you can see the power of YWCA. We're here to stay, but we're here to also figure out what are the challenges that are coming down the pike. To be that futuristic organization that is preparing itself for the challenges that are coming down, for the, in, the, the income inequalities, for the future of work. How is automation, v, uh, AI and VR going to impact opportunities and ladders of, uh, ladders of opportunities for, in the workplace? Education, how are we going to approach what's happening to this generation in terms of education? We're not only talking about the digital divide, but the digital abyss. All of that infrastructure, both physical and social infrastructure that is so desperately needed in communities. We want to continue to be that voice, that voice that will drive awareness, that will provide information, that will empower individuals to be the change agents in their communities. Again, I can only say that when it's most daunting, when the night is most darkest, that is when hope really takes, must take hold. And that's why I'm excited because I know, I know the leadership of YWCAs across the country and I know the spirit of our persimmon sisterhood. With that, I want to thank you for spending time with us this evening, for giving us very precious moments of your life to let us not only speak about racial justice, but to promote racial justice, to be those um, loyal believers that we must get this done. So I wanna thank you again, and I'm looking forward to the next uh, series of conversation. Thank you. On behalf of YWCA USA, I am forever grateful for the work, for the volunteer hours, for your donations, for your voice to be part of our mission of eliminating racism and empowering women. Thank you very much. USA has done this year as the local associations have faced huge needs as a result of the circumstances of the day and um, social services in addition to advocating for justice and equity. Martha? So we're just gonna take a moment to invite you um, as audience members. You've been great about adding comments and uh, putting things into the chat. So if you have questions as Paula goes along with Alejandra, we invite you to put your question in the chat. I'm gonna step away and monitor the chat so that we can keep track of uh, your questions. Look forward to hearing from you all. So Alejandra, tell us how your education and work experiences have prepared you to lead YWCA USA. That's a great question, uh, 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 Paula, because I think when you and I first talked uh, just a few days ago, I, I really honestly said, it feels like my journey in life, every single step of the way, whether it was my education or the, uh, the incredible opportunities to serve in, in government and the private sector, I needed all of that in order to be able to uh, join YWCA and be able to have the vision to lead it. Um, it is an incredible organization. And as you well know, we have over 200 associations across the country with, in, with leaders that are just beyond belief in terms of their energy, their vision. So in many ways, every skill set that I've been able to accumulate um, has been important because 
at this moment in time, when we talk about an organization like YWCA, an organization that has, um, you know, proven the test of time, 162 years in, in action, um, and then confronting all the challenges that we're, we're confronting today, you need to be able to understand how, the, how Congress works, how communication and marketing works. How do we engage um, programs and really design programs that meet the needs of the 21st century? We are really that organization, which is incredible because I, I seem to fall in love with the organization every single day. We're all the organization that, that's the, um, the cutting edge. We're at the forefront of some of the issues. So I'm grateful that um, you know it took uh, 30 years of, of experience to be able to um, not only discover YWCA, but to be able to be part of it. So um, a long journey, but everything uh, that I've accumulated throughout the year, I can see how it all fits in. That's great, thank you. So we know the needs of poor women who are more likely to be brown or black face even greater odds of surviving this economic crisis. Share with us how the YWCA is addressing women and families of color. Sure. So um, during this particular pandemic, and you know, the New York Times has um, called uh, this particular recession the she session, because so much of what's happening is really happening around women and is more specifically women of color. So at YWCA, we just recently released um, uh, a white paper, which I'll put on the chat in a second. But basically, we decide, we understood that the pandemic, the economic recession, and the uh, racial reckoning um, uh, with regards to racial justice, it all came into, into focus, especially around women. So a couple of things that we're doing very concretely. One is we went into, we went into um, uh, problem solving as you know, which is our, the, one of the best traits that we have as, as YWCA. So how did we problem solve? First, we created an emergency relief fund because we knew that the pandemic was going to hit us hard um, on so many levels. The other thing, Paula, that I will tell you is it's been remarkable. YWCAs have not shut their doors um, at, because we, we saw the rise in domestic violence, but we also saw the, the challenges with regards to um, both the healthcare issues as well as the childcare issue. So in, in many respects, we pivoted, we found ways to keep our YWCAs uh, you know, just afloat, and now we're finding ways to helping them thrive. Um, but I will tell you, um, the road is very long and winding. I don't know what is to come, particularly because the nonprofit sector is being left to answer to so many of these issues. And this is where we need to appeal to both government and the, the philanthropic community. We have to solve this together. We have to come together to really envision and imagine what are some of the solutions that we have to bring to bear. You know, it breaks my heart when we see so many families, particularly single, uh, single women, who have children who have to contend with, where do I take my kids for childcare? Will I lose my job because I'm in the most vulnerable of industries, whether it's hospitality uh, uh, or different services? And, um, and what's the future of work? So there are a lot of different uh, challenges ahead of us, but I'm, I'm optimistic because if there's anything that YWCAs are well known for is problem solving. That's great. Martha, do we have any questions? Yes, Paula, we have one. Uh, I think it was Angela that asked, uh, Alejandra, is there a city that you have are aware of, and it may be a YWCA city, that exemplifies system change that has seen an increase in racial sensitivity, effective policy change, yeah. that led to better mixing of, de of the demographics within that community? You know, Martha, that's an excellent question. And I'll tell you some, uh, you know, we have such incredible um, uh, best practices that I can go through the entire country. You know, I'll tell you, um, Diane Payton in a y at YWCA of Baton Rouge is doing some incredible work. Uh, Margaret Mitchell with her 21 day racial justice challenge is doing some incredible work um, in, in, um, in Cleveland. There are so many 
um, models out there. And here's what we're doing, because what we've discovered is we need to do a complete inventory and a complete assessment of our entire network and pull up all of those best practices. Because one thing that is true about YWCA, we have the ability to pilot and then to scale. And the question that you pose is, is very important because if we really wanna do systemic change, we have to find what are those, what is that collection of, of interventions that can really start to drive change, both generationally, geographically, income level, uh, ethnic level. So our, the, the, the months ahead are going to be very interesting to us because once we do that assessment of all of the programs that exist, what's effective, what is making inroads in, in different communities, because we also have to contend with, we're not just in urban areas or suburban areas, we're also in rural areas. We're in the north, we're in the south, we're in the east and we're in the west and in the, in the heartland. So because of our diversity and our presence, we have that um, very comparative advantage, so to speak, to be able to say, here's what works in communities that have this type of profile. You know, what works in Darien, Connecticut, doesn't work necessarily in El Paso, Texas. So being able to hone in and tune in and then elevating all of those tools and best practices is really going to be exciting. Um, I will tell you that it, it's, in, it's incredible to see how YWCAs have stood up and have really tailored their racial justice work to the communities that they serve. Um, and when they do that, the effectiveness is incredible, as well as the buy-in, right? You can't, you can't just impose racial justice programs. You need the buy-in of the community. You need the sustainability of your, of your supporters, as well as how does it evolve, right? Um, so it's exciting work. There's a lot of great uh, examples. I'm happy to share them with you and, and with your audience and, and uh, through, through a follow-up email if that's, if that's helpful. But um, I will tell you that, um, as I said in my video, this is work that we do day in and day out. That's great. I'm gonna turn it back over to Paula for one last wrap-up question. Thank you, Alejandra. Uh, one thing I want to wrap things up with is a question that asks, um, do you have any words of advice or any thoughts on race and gender justice you'd like to share in closing with our audience tonight? Well, uh, that, that's a great question. Yes, um, a couple of things. You know, we are now forced to look at the issues of racism and discrimination, and we need to start looking at them with a, a futuristic lens. I'm gonna ask everyone to bear with me for a second. But right now, there is the development of algorithms. There's an algorithm for everything right now. In those algorithms, there is embedded biases, whether it's algorithms that determine whether you're credit worthy and you can get access to capital, whether it's algorithms as it relates to your likelihood of being successful in a particular program. We have to be vigilant as, as, as to how racism systemic racism is rearing its head. It's becoming sometimes in many situations, less visible, less tangible, and sometimes you don't even have legal standing to challenge it. This whole conversation of racial, uh, of, of biases and algorithm is going to be that future issue that we have to pay attention to. In addition to all the other things that we're paying attention to, whether it's racism as a public health issue, racism as it relates to the environment, racism as it relates to um, economic opportunity. All of it is going to be front and center to us, but we have to continue to be vigilant. As YWCA USA, let me tell you, we have no problem, you know, going to Congress, writing, the, uh, writing those policy recommendations, making sure that um, you know, issues that are, are impacting f uh, families and, and women and communities of color are critical to our policy agenda. There will be a new Congress coming in in less than 45 days and a new administration. How do we start to um, not only prepare, but to be relentless 
um, uh, and being sure that as um, our decision makers and our leaders at the national level continue to tackle these issues, that we continue to put pressure on them so that they can come to organizations like yours, like YWCA of Southeast Wisconsin. You have the finger on the pulse. I'm just your advocate, but you have the finger on the pulse. You know what's happening. And we need your voices to come to DC and to advocate at all levels. So I'm very passionate about uh, these issues because I'm seeing them in fruition. And I tell you, by, uh, biases and algorithms is going to be a issue that we're going to have to contend with and it's the moment is right now Thank you. now paula i know we're running out of time but i wanted to see if there was a way to get you to answer one of my questions only because not only do you have an incredible uh uh you've had an incredible impact on who the YWCA is today with all the great work that you've done. But I wanna, I, I would love to get your counsel and guidance because what are you seeing? What, what one, what makes you hopeful for the future? Uh, well, you threw me for a loop on that one. I think um, I'm very proud of the work of YWCA Southeast Wisconsin. I think um, the organization has been able to uh, put its mark on Milwaukee in a way that few others have been able to manage. I think uh, Martha and her crew and the people that she works with have uh, really shown a lot of courage and have brought many people on the journey with them. And um, more and more of those people are starting to get braver and speak up and uh, help push the message more. I think in terms of um, what I might feel hopeful about way. Um, I describe the issues that we see today as being like locusts. They go away for 15, 16, 17 years and something stirs them up and they come back out. So I think work on eliminating You, you were saying that it sounded like eliminating race, bringing these issues back is like locusts? Yes. That's the analogy I use. They go away for about 15, 16, 17 years or something. Stay quiet. They're dormant during that period. And whatever happens in nature to bring them back is, is very reliable. And I see um, issues related to women's rights. If I think about the fact that we're over 100 years now into uh, women's suffrage, yet we see uh, women being adversely impacted at rates greater than um, those of men during this um, pandemic. We see um, racism rear its ugly head in a way that's not unlike what we saw in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, in the wake of um, the unrest in the 70s and 80s. So I think we're in for some more challenging times, but I see the work of the YWCA as, as being such that uh, the organization is uniquely positioned to really help the country in addressing some of these tough issues. 
So Paula, I know that we're running out of time, but I'm going to abuse a little bit of this privilege. You know, we have a podcast at YWCA and it's called Organize Your Butterflies. It is a, it, we, we borrowed it from Dr. Dorothy Height, who you know was such an incredible leader in our movement. And basically that is a term of when we are most uncertain about the future, when those butterflies are in our stomach and, and are telling us, you know, warning or, or alerting us, we have to organize them. In this moment in time, Paula, again, seeking your wisdom and, and the incredible contribution that you did for YWCA USA, how do you organize your butterflies? How do you find that purpose and that meaning when everything around us can feel so uncertain? Well, I'll tell you, I'm not Dorothy I hike. I don't have the, I don't have the patience that she had. Um, I think I've, I have a sense of urgency right now that has grown over the years, Alejandra, and I, um, it's hard for me to hold back. And I'm a, in a position in my life right now where I don't feel like I have a lot to lose. So I, I feel impatient and I want people to act. I'm glad we have leadership of uh, YWCA in the area here. I'm very pleased with the work that Martha and her team does. I'm very pleased with the work we do in the area of um, education and helping women uh, more so in that program in particular, helping women uh, get the skills they need to be um, really effective leaders of their home and their business and their personal development. So, you know, I don't, I, I really have difficulty in answering that question directly about my own butterflies. I just um, shake out my wings and do my thing when I feel like it. You know, if something needs to be said, I am going to say it. I, um, I just don't, I think life is short. Um, I think I'm, you know, I'm like in the fourth chapter of my life right now. And I have to do what I need to do as long as I can while I'm still here on this planet. Well, that's a beautiful takeaway. And thank you for, for that gift. Shake out, shake out our wings and do our thing. You're absolutely right. I think the urgency is now. Um, and as the saying go, if not now, when, if not us, who, right? That's so, right. Um, so thank you. Um, you, you've left me with a beautiful, a beautiful takeaway. Yeah, I guess I'm like Martin Luther King's expression about the fierce urgency of now. Um, I'm kind of in that space a lot these days. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight and sharing YWCA USA's perspective. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Martha. Thank you so much, Alejandra. And thanks for Paula uh, being here tonight. And for, it just makes me realize what an evening of amazing women sharing stories, uh, telling us what they've figured out, what they've done. And I'm so proud of us in terms of uh, women just have a way of taking over. And so I want us to just take a moment to realize that uh, as we're ending, to encourage you to stay involved with the YWCA. And the classes that we offer, the Unlearning Racism starts at the end of January. Those classes will be live on our website tomorrow, December 10th. And on top of that, we always appreciate your contributions. So we appreciate if people go out to our website and decide to give to support our work. Uh, there's a lot that we know we need to do in the region to go after organizations, businesses, and leaders. Um, and we can only do that work when people contribute and help us out. So we end tonight with a reminder. Uh, Jasmine Ward edited a book of essays that was entitled The Fire This Time. And one of the essays was A Message to My Daughters by Edwige Dantica, a writer who was born in Haiti and lived and raised herself, at, raised, was raised with her family in New York. And she was addressing her daughters and talking about the joys and pains that they would face. And she said, dear Myra and Lila, I've put off writing this letter to you for as long as I can, but I don't think I can put it off any longer. Please know that there will be times when some people might be hostile or even violent to you for reasons that have nothing to do with your beauty, your humor, or your grace, but only your race and the color of your skin. 
please don't let this restrict your freedom, break your spirit, or kill your joy. And if possible, do everything you can to change the world so that your generation of black and brown men, women, and children will be the last to experience this. And please do live your best lives and achieve your full potential. Love deeply, be joyful, in Jubilee, mom. Such important reminders to all of our beloved black, indigenous, and people of color. Live your best life. So as we end our justice journey tonight, one final quote struck me as an imperative uh, to share with everyone. Daniel Jose Older wrote an essay in the same book by Jesmyn Ward, and it was an essay that he wrote to his, his wife. And he said, you don't tiptoe towards justice. You can't walk up to the door all polite and knock once or twice, hoping someone's home. Justice is a door that, when closed, must be kicked in. So my message to you, open your heart and your life to justice. Kick in that door. Decide to care. Challenge injustice wherever you see it. Be an advocate, an agitator, a co-conspirator. Help us as, and join us as we build our own muscle around advocacy to address the many challenges that we've talked about tonight. Sign up for our racial justice programs because you matter. Your ideas, your spirit, your contribution, it's unique to you. We want you to share it widely, get involved and decide to change the world. So stay connected. Thanks for coming tonight. We invite you to stay on for a few minutes. We've got some great murals of um, murals from around Milwaukee that are gonna be showing at the end of the presentation. And hopefully it will inspire you to remember why this work has some joy that comes from it. So remember to wear your mask, do social distance. For the next few months, we have to overcome this pandemic and we can tackle this pandemic and racism together. Join us. Thank you so much for joining us tonight.